Hey everybody, I'm Dom. I'm one of the co-founders of Wallet ID, and we're building decentralized identity and wallet solutions used by thousands of developers, governments, DAOs, businesses. Uh, but today I'm not here to shill the company. I'm here to talk about decentralized identity. And I think a good place to start is uh, why the whole topic is exciting and why I actually got into this space. Uh, and so the reason is quite simple. Uh, when I first got into the identity industry, I saw that there's a major shift transforming how identity works online. And the way I summarize that shift is to say that identity data moves from apps to users. And what that means is that we are moving from this world today, uh, the old world, where uh, people who are providing applications basically have to take care about identity themselves. Um, which results in the fact that you know the average person has more than 100 different accounts across hundreds of different of, uh, applications uh, where data is siloed, disconnected, fragmented, to this world, a world where everybody can control their identity information from identity wallets uh, in order to very easily share that information with whatever application they want to use, right? So we're moving from a state where data is siloed and disconnected and fragmented to a world where data is user controlled, secure, easy to share, verifiable. So, all that sounds good, but the question is, how far along are we actually? Like, is this realistically to achieve it over the next couple of years? Because people have been working on this for a long time. Uh, and so, to illustrate how far we came along, I built the decentralized identity flywheel. So, quick question, how many of you are familiar with the concept of a flywheel? Okay, a few. So for everybody who doesn't know what that is, uh, it refers to this notion of a big flywheel that's very hard to turn in the beginning, but once it's spinning, it goes very fast. And so if you know the right le levers of a market or of your business, if you know where to push, you can really accelerate the adoption of new technologies. And so the decentralized identity flywheel has four different levers that we can pull. Uh, the first one is really the emergence of decentralized identity ecosystems. Uh, and over the last eight years or so, we've seen the emergence of numerous permissionless blockchains, uh, as well as, which is very important in the context of identity, uh, consortium-based blockchains by governments, by consortia across different industries. And these identity ecosystems are very important for two reasons. The first reason is that they establish the technical foundation that enables decentralized identity, right? A single source of truth that enables us to verify uh, data in a decentralized ecosystem. The second important point is that it, they attract builders across industries. Uh, builders like myself who are building companies that uh, develop uh, dev tooling as well as standards to make sure that everybody can very easily adopt these new technologies. Right? So we see open source companies driving adoption. We see standards that enable global interoperability and backwards compatibility. And we see uh, integration with legacy tools to make sure that existing enterprise infrastructure can actually use these new technologies. And so what the development of infrastructure and dev tooling does is it, enable, it enables applications which create real world value. And what we're seeing is that all the major players that we need are getting into the game. That means important data sources like governments, banks, and large enterprises that can attest all kinds of information about you, as well as major tech companies like you know, Microsoft, Google, Apple, open banking companies, and so on. And finally, we see uh, industry-leading businesses across various verticals like you know, employment, HR, supply chain, healthcare, all adopting these technologies to make sure that we can have use cases um, basically everywhere, right? And uh, once these apps are being developed, we come to a final point which is regulations. And regulations, in the case of identity, are really good for adoption because what they do is they not only incentivize the adoption of decentralized identity, but in many cases actually force it. So especially Europe spear spearheading uh, governments and regulators globally um, by providing regulations like the ADAS2 regulations, which forces decentralized identity wallets in public and private sector, but also re uh, other regulations related to anti-money laundering uh, industries uh, or crypto which at the end of the day can only be complied with if we have identity wallets that allow us to share data freely and verifiably. Uh, and these regulations in turn obviously you know, drive forward with the flywheel. So they further grow ecosystems, attract more builders, and with this also more applications. So at the end of the day, it's happening. We see private sector adoption with businesses across industries from banking to media and education. We see 
governments, supranational organizations like the Commission, national governments, regional governments like cities, building pilots and getting ready for large-scale uh, production deployments. And we see the regulations I mentioned before in areas like EID, anti-money laundering, crypto regulation, data protection, and so on. So how does it work? How can you think about this? It's actually quite, quite simple. Every use case, regardless the, of the industry that, that you're thinking about, always has three different roles or perspectives, if you will. So there's always three different parties to it. There's the data sources, the so-called issuers, you can see them on the left-hand side, which have data about you. And what they do is, instead of issuing physical cards, they can just issue digital and signed credentials to your identity applications, your wallets, with which you can easily share that information with anybody to easily and quickly um, use products and services online, right? It can be cities, it can be employers, it can be online platforms. And this is a more technical uh, view on the whole situation where you can clearly see that one thing is everything related to blockchain on top, which is really just the ecosystem that establishes a single source of truth for certain information like public keys. And then below and completely decoupled from that, the decentralized identity infrastructure that's actually integrated into the enterprise uh, tools that we have today. So a nice framework about thinking about, for thinking about decentralized identity is to actually think about it in three different layers. Uh, the bottom layer being the identity ecosystems we talked about, right? The blockchains that establish trust, uh, trust registries and trust frameworks. So this is all about governance. Then we have identity infrastructure that enables, makes it very easy for companies in different verticals to uh, launch applications and use cases that create real world value, right? Like, banks launching identity wallets, recruiting tools or assessment tools, HRM engagement tools, and all these kinds of things. Um, one thing that's also important and I want to spend a bit of time on <laughs> uh, are the different decentralized identity flavors. Because when people talk about decentralized identity, they're pretty religious about the technologies that are being used. Uh, and so here are three different approaches that you can take. Uh, we're starting with one, the, the one that's most promising and that will probably be the dominating technology uh, over the next couple of years and it's called self-sovereign identity. The reason why it's so interesting is because it's been specifically designed for identity use cases, which means that all identity information is kept off-chain. The whole technology can be implemented in a way that's completely compliant with GDPR or EID regulations like EIDIS2. The standards are coming from actual internet standardization organizations and not necessarily from crypto, which means that we can build on standards that, have already, that are already being used by 80 plus percent of all the websites out there. And blockchains are optional, so you can use them, but it's not, not, a, not a necessity. The second way of implementing decentralized identity are NFTs and SPTs. So the thing is, when NFTs uh, came up two years ago or so, they were initially, NFTs have initially been designed to model property rights, right, of tokenized assets. So the thing is, NFTs have never really been built to model identity use cases. And so what that means is that you have a couple of downsides which make NFTs interesting for certain identity use cases, but not for others, simply because, you know, a lot of the information is actually public or even put on chain, which means you run into compliance issues sooner or later. The standards are really coming from the crypto community, which means that backwards compatibility, compatibility is often a little bit difficult. Uh, but all of that being said, there are still lots of use cases that make a lot of sense and where, where NFTs are uh, even better than self-sovereign identity and verifiable credentials. Uh, think about ticketing or uh, use cases where you think about organizational identity, uh, when, where you simply don't have any compliance issues at all. Lastly, uh, mobile driver's license, or MDOCs. Uh, that's like the oldest type of uh, decentralized identity technology that you can think of. It's been standardized by ISO. Um, but it's very important because companies like Apple and Google are already rolling out support for MDL. So potentially, the first identity credentials that you will have in wallets on your phone will be based on these MDOC standards. Uh, the problem with this is that it's inherently linked to a centralized architecture, right? In theory, you can build it on a decentralized one, but at the end of the day, MDL is, is, is uh, let's say, uh, so mature, which is an upside, but on the other hand, also, you know, designed for a world where that's just been built around uh, centralized systems. And so uh, the way to think about these flavors is that they all have different upsides and downsides, advantages and disadvantages. And uh, looking at the use case you want to build, you have to be very careful about choosing which one you actually want to use. 
Um, so yeah, quickly going through some use cases and let's see, maybe there's some time for questions afterwards, even if there are any. Um, so I chose three different use cases that we're working on with clients uh, from three industries that um, we've, where we've seen most adoption from. So the one is uh, quite obvious, right? It's customer onboarding. That can be in KYC regulated industries, but it's not a necessity. The whole idea is that instead of creating an account with a service, filling out forms, or even um, going through some video identification processes if you want to open a bank account, everything becomes a one-click process, right? I can share any information I want with just one click, simply by sharing information from my wallet with uh, basically any service I want to. Um, the next set of use cases is in, is in education. That's interesting because, especially in Europe, we see hundreds of universities moving in that space. There's actually one university outside, Howest, we've been working with that are, have already been implemented diploma and student ID use cases with local banks. So you can really see an uptake um, from uh, universities across various countries that are building these types of use cases in education. Uh, and the last one, uh, is about employment and HR. So there's different ecosystems that are popping up, especially in the employment space. And what you can think about in the context of employment is that there's many use cases which make it very interesting. So one thing is the whole connection to education. The second thing is that in the employment context, you always have lots of potential for fraud. So there's always uh, the need for you know, employee ID, access rights, checking of licenses, permits for construction workers, and so on. So that's really... Uh, a lot of things you can build. I mean, here's some, some other use cases, and what you can see is that uh, it really doesn't stop with these, th uh, these three industries, right? You can also think about, for example, uh, the whole impact of generative AI, right? How can we make sure that um, content that is being created by whatever uh, is being verifiable in terms of its authenticity? One way to do this is by using technologies like these to make sure that we can verify who created the content. And then you can think about anything else like you know, social media, Twitter, for example. How can we make sure that only real people can sign up to a service without having to pay X dollars? Um, that's basically it. Um, feel free to connect with me. That's my uh, QR code for LinkedIn. If you want to have the slides, happy to share them. Um, so yeah, if, I think I have one minute left. So if there's one or two questions, you can shoot. If not, thanks for your attention. Looks like no question. Ah, okay, we're good. Ah, shoot. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's well. It's it's interesting. It's definitely not aligned with what all the governments are have, are, are doing. So, um, I, I don't think like maybe it's being used in the private sector, but it will definitely not be used for high level insurance use cases, like you know, in banking, for example. Uh, but I think there's definitely a place for solutions like these, right? Because as, a, as an application, I can determine which kind of identity proofs I accept as long as I'm not regulated. So, and there's good people behind it. So we'll, we'll know in, in two years, maybe. <laughs> yeah? If you're working with uh, like the public sector, like yeah. uh, do they plan to make uh, these licenses or passports or whatever like revocable within the system? For sure, yeah. How how do you feel about that? <laughs> that they're revocable? Yeah. I think in certain for certain use cases, it's just necessary, right? Uh, if you think about driver's license, well, if somebody drives drunk, you you have to revoke these kinds of things. Same goes with other professional licenses, right? If there's misconduct, you just have to revoke it. So I think there's use cases where you can go full on decentralized, permissionless, whatnot, but then there's certain use cases where you just want to have certain control over the identity information. So that's, that's what I think about it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Have a good one.